the film doesn't really put a moral. There, I mean, you know, if this film were made in America, there would be some tragedy that would happen that would push it into melodramatic kind of zones of, you know, there would be some punishment of some sort for her. Ellen Louise yeah, driving off exactly, the Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, there would be something like that neither of these women could, could achieve some kind of happiness, you know. And um, I also, yeah, I mean, I thought it was really interesting. I also thought it was interesting having just thought sort of flashed into my mind during the thing about the, the Van Dykes during the, um, sort of during the same period in America, kind of. I know that we're, I'm not trying to push a little <laughs> thing onto it again, like again, but it was just interesting, that, that parallel, you know. Right. Josh? I actually, I, I don't think it's like, ah, oh, come on, at all. I think there's a lot of times in the film when I, part of me was cringing at like, you know, how dated it was and how silly and over the top it was. But then when I think about it, in a way, it was really unidealistic in the sense that these women were dealing in a, their lives, they were not perfect feminists by any stretch, they really wanted to be independent. But when you look at what they're struggling with throughout the film, their happiness or unhappiness is constantly defined vis-a-vis -vis men. Mm -hmm. Whether they're lonely, whether they can get what they want, you know, they, they slip up and make sure he slips up and makes a decision in a moment of weakness and follows this man to Iran. I mean, and then even at the end, it's like, she's happy because she has family. And it's sort of like, well, what does that say? Does a woman still need family, even when it's defined in a modern way? And I, in a way, I think that's ultimately what makes me love the film, is that it's saying feminism is complicated. It's not about right. being the, the prototypical idealistic feminist who can go off and say, I can define my happiness the way I want. It's saying, it's fucking complicated. You can't just define yourself as happy. Okay. Right. Well, right. Some parts are represented as very simplistic, and then other parts are very complicated. I agree. Oh, I want to say what I like about this movie is the morality and optimism in its true sense is knowing, you know, sorrow and all of that, and still having that kind of attitude. So, I, what I like about this film is that it might seem like whimsical and all, you know, a little happy too happy and all that, but it still has uh, really brilliant things, like philosophical, sort of ironic, but still playful. Mm -hmm. It's not like satirical, but it's, it has a perfect balance of, of that sort of innocence and, and knowingness in, in a very like sort of, um, it might seem simple when you look at it, but in the end it's like, I'm optimistic even though I know it's hard. And so I think that's it's also got these two, I thought, really beautiful performances right, by yeah. these really nuanced, sort of very naturalistic, totally yeah. like, you know, really, really strong, beautiful performances. And I think mean, that's, it's, it's not really uh, an ironic film in a way. It's what, the way that the, you guys are responding is really, I think what's interesting is that we're responding very heartfelt. So we got time for two more questions. Yes. Well, I just wanted to make a comment that I also, saw this film when it was released, and then I had the opportunity to um, be volunteering with it and ought to be a number of years ago, and was able to uh, receive the film through some archives and present it to a group. And I truly never, ever, ever believed I would see it again. And I could not believe I was local here and they're showing this. There were two things that, um, there was a couple content on it, and two things that I didn't realize in 1977. Um, and what I didn't realize was Agnes Varda's um, reliance, how this was a new place for French films, how so much of the photography, he was a photographer, the first lover, and he had hanged himself. And there were, there was photographs of the wedding. There was a lot of, I think, her, uh, or the, the new realization of what photography and film could do, mm -hmm. which, it, which was new in, in the centuries, so to speak, because it just had really, the film was new, and, and she was part of the new group of filmmakers. And I, I think it's kind of taken for granted today, but the, 
um, amount of usage of the cameras within the film is very interesting to me. Um, what I really felt watching this today was how prescient she was. Um, it's hard to describe, and I think some people in the audience have expressed it and others just don't understand, um, what it was like for women to form friendships as women. It was it was a cusp really it was the emergence of feminism and um, abortion had been illegal and we had, you know, and we knew women who had had illegal abortions. You knew women who had fled to foreign countries because it was romantic and had become enslaved and had to be taken out of these countries. And watching the film today, I was thinking, in this country, in the world, uh, women's freedom, abortion is certainly at risk. Uh, women uh, going into the veil um, and perhaps coming to a town near you um, is at risk. Uh, women's friendships are identified as perhaps the, if, if you have a deep friendship with a woman, then you must be a lesbian. Um, it was, it was a very different era, and women bonded because of the, the nature of the times and the emergence of so much of what I think, you know, is so wonderful to take for granted, glorious films, and I also love that, you know, um, you know that women make films, that women have friends, uh, that women uh, don't have to get married, um, that family is changing, the politics of what was what she was talking about um, seems to me to have to have come back to where we are today. So I mean, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah, thanks for your comments. Yeah. Any last question? Yes, here. Um, I just I feel so strange about the, the conversation that was happening about the fail mm -hmm. and how there's this like general consensus that, oh, that's so anti-feminist. And I mean, I just think that's easy for us to say from a New York City or American or Western point of view, but I think maybe Agnes Martin has spent a lot of time around as far as I know, was touching upon different paradigms of feminism from other cultures from the quote unquote Orient. So it just, it just felt a little gross as an audience here to immediately eschew the veil as, uh, as an affront to feminism. So you think it's much more... Uh, well, I, I guess from my, from my, because I was part of that conversation, I, I just recently have spent time with a, a number of women from Iran who have left Iran and, and had lots of conversations about them trying to create images in Iran as filmmakers mm -hmm. and the complications as women partially because of the veil. So, uh, and, and oh, no, I mean, so, that, so, so I, it was from a very specific experience that, that I had that I was speaking of. Right. Yeah, no, I think there's room for all of it, so I'm glad you brought it up. I just had also, it's not a question, I just had one other comment, which I thought was in, uh, relating to, you're talking about Agnes Varda being a woman making a women's film in this otherwise extremely male-oriented French New Wave or in any film world, actually, since most 99% of the directors can be men in this world, um, is also just that there was, it wasn't, the voiceovers were like an omniscient <laughs> female voice. It was really beautiful. It was like this woman telling a story about these other women, and sometimes it was within the voice of one of the characters, and sometimes it was this other woman who you didn't know who it was, you know, and it was like, oh, okay, it's the filmmaker. <coughs> you know, it was, it was just this really kind of like, um, really nourishing way of, of having the story told. Not only was it glowing, sunny, and, you know, all this kind of stuff, which was also very kind of like, helped to make it feel like a feel-good movie, even when things like abortion are being, like, you know, fought on the battle lines and stuff. Um, it still also just felt like it was a really... Uh, a, a different view of life as opposed to um, the sort of part, you know, it, it, 
at the same time that was being made, you think, you know, in America, we, we had like a sort of our own 70s films, which were great from studio movies. Um, but they were really about like the harshness of life, not in a kind, soft way, you know. Although in 77, I guess we're talking about like, the beginnings of blockbuster movies too, but, you know, I just, I really liked having this other voice coming in and like sort of explaining what's going on and like, you know, and she was happy. And she said, you don't always need to have the man around, but she was okay with that, you know. And it was like, wow, I love this. It was like a diary or something, you know. Thank you. Any last words? Um, no, I'm really happy that everyone came out, and it was it was wonderful to sort of like have a group experience watching this film, and I think it, it sort of made it even more poignant and uh, memorable again. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, January for Michelle T.